This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. And you have arrived here on Creep Street. I mean, can you believe it? I mean, good golly, it is Creep Street in the month of March. Wow. I mean, just big time wow. Oh, we got some bangers. We got some bangers. You know what? We are creeping up quick. And I mean quick on Creep Street's third anniversary. Yeah, it's at the end of March. It's going to be three years of Creep Street. Can you even believe? I, I mean... It's it's incredible. It's, it's straight up whacked. Well, if you want to follow all the whackedness, of course... Like, follow, subscribe, uh, Creep Street Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. We are also on TikTok. Also on Facebook, there is a separate little page. It's a forum called Citizens of the Milky Way, a Creep Street fan page. Anyone is welcome to join that. You just click the let me in button and one of us will let you in. It's a place where daily we like to just, us and our listeners like to post stories, share jokes, memes, just interact. It's a lot of fun. We let you know what the week's episode is going to be a few days ahead of time. That's right. Super fun. And of course, if once a week is not enough. And I need you right now to look deep inside yourself. Yeah. And really ask the tough questions. Get in there. Look deep. Spread those cheeks and look. Mm Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I think you'll realize once a week is not enough, but don't you worry. Don't. Please, don't even fret for a fucking second. Because we've got you covered. Just head on over to patreon.com slash Podcast for all sorts of bonus goodies. Now, Maureen. Yeah. Today's episode centers around a man who might be one of the most chodiest of chodes. I mean... For sure. For sure. It is next level, this man's chodiness. This man is so sick and evil. Yes. I mean, you know, as we said, we've been doing this podcast for almost three years. We are searching the weirdest shit constantly. Yes. Our internet search history is probably, the FBI is probably, you know. I'm sure we're on a watch list. They're checking in. What I'm trying to say is we have researched and read about so many different crazy fucking things in the world. Yes. And I got to say, this guy stands out as one of the fucking chodiest, sickest, most evil motherfucker. Truly loathe him. Maureen, what are we talking about? Today we are talking about Larry Ray and the cult at Sarah Lawrence. My God. We're diving in. And now I don't want to, I just want to, before we really, you know, get, get wet and wild here, this guy fucking sucks. He is depraved. He is evil. We hate him. Truly. However, and this is not to diminish what he has done, which we will see in the episode. Don't freak out about listening. It's not in the sick in the same way as like. The Gainesville Ripper. Yes, exactly. It's not like the Gainesville Ripper. It's It's not like physically gross like that. Although he is physically violent. violent, It's a different, it's a different sort of thing. And I'm not saying that this is like what Larry Ray did is not a big deal or whatever. Like, I'm I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, just don't, you don't. 
don't worry. Like it, yes, you're, it's the, not as it's not as graphic as like some other, you know, this this episode at least is not going to be as graphic as, you know, some other ones. So like basically light trigger warning, but like I wouldn't really worry yeah. about it. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Maureen, tell us about those sources. Okay. Okay. If you want to know. <laughs> if you want to know, I'll tell you. We have some fantastic sources today, as we always do. I mean, give it up for all of our fantastic sources over the past three years. Give it up. I mean, gosh darn it. Good stuff. One is an article titled, The Stolen Kids of Sarah Lawrence. What happened to the group of bright college students who fell under the sway of a classmate's father? By Ezra Marcus and James D. Walsh at The Cut. Then we have... Who is Larry Ray? Everything to know about the Sarah Lawrence sex cult by Jessica Sager at People. And then we have a wonderful, and I mean wonderful, and I don't mean wonderful like it's a fun watch. You know, it's just very well made documentary, docu-series on Hulu called Stolen Youth. Yes. Now, I highly recommend you check out all of these sources on your own just to get, you know, every little morsel of what's going on here if you're interested in this story. But we're going to dive deep today here too, don't you worry. And also, before we get started, a quick shout out to a wonderful friend of ours that is fantastic. The channel is called Dine in Psychology, and she did an amazing episode on Larry Ray as well. And that was also very eye opening and enlightening. That's a great episode to learn more about, like, the psychology of, yes. of this. I mean, it, she it's, is so cool. Love her as yeah. a source. She's just so cool. Yeah. Big, big fan. So highly recommend you check out her videos. That's once again, that's Dine in Psychology. Yes. So I wanted to start out today's episode by just reading a quote from U.S. Attorney Damian Williams. And this is a quote about Larry Ray. Twelve years ago, Larry Ray moved into his daughter's dorm room at Sarah Lawrence College. And when he got there, he met a group of friends who had their whole lives ahead of them. For the next decade, he used violence, threats, and psychological abuse to try to control and destroy their lives. He exploited them. He terrorized them. He tortured them. Let me be very clear. Larry Ray is a predator, an evil man who did evil things. And that is absolutely what he is. So we will start our story for this week in the fall of 2009 in New York State at Sarah Lawrence College. Well, good golly. And I just want to say this is also the same time I started college. Oh, my goodness. So kind of it, it just makes it just kind of hits home a lot for me. I also went to a college in New York State as well. You're right. You went to Syracuse, same state as Sarah Lawrence. Yes. I mean, they're very different schools, but like. Of course. But, you know, it's just I feel connect. It makes me feel even more connected to the story. Absolutely. So Sarah Lawrence College, for those of you who don't know, is a liberal arts college in New York. It's like I don't know exactly how far away it is from New York, but uh, from New York City. But I think it's pretty close. I think it's only like 15 or 20 miles or something like that. Right. But it's like a very, almost like storybook looking campus and town. It's like small town safe. We love it here. Yes. And Sarah Lawrence, as far as I know, I think has always been a very well-respected school. Yes. Very highly regarded. You have to, you know, you got to be smart to go there. Yeah. If you are familiar with the film, 10 Things I Hate About You. um, Oh, yeah. Julia Stiles character yes. cat wanted to go to Sarah Lawrence. That's right because she the movie takes she goes to high school in Seattle. Yes. And she wants to go across the country to Sarah, Sarah Lawrence. Lawrence. Oh, you're totally right. I forgot about that. And I just bring that up because I think if you have seen that movie, that is a very good representation of like the vibe of the people that go to Sarah Lawrence. Okay. Like it's all very kind of known for being very like open-minded, very into literature, very into the arts. Right. Very politically active. Yes. Very intelligent. Yeah. And two, it's the last place you would think a piece of shit like Larry Ray would be able to like... Pull this off. It's very weird. Pull this off at. In a way, it's weird, but in another way... I think it makes so much sense. And you're probably right. You know the story way better than I do, but yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just because people, and we'll get into this more as we go on, but just like people, college students, young college students, all of them, it's very much a transformative time where you're learning more about yourself and you're maybe experimenting with things. And I don't even mean like sex or drugs, even though that is possible, but just like figuring out more about yourself right. in general. And Sarah Lawrence, in many other colleges, I'm 
not saying just Sarah Lawrence, but like colleges like Sarah Lawrence really kind of encourage you to like take another look at yourself and think and be open-minded and think about finding your true self and being your authentic self. Right. So in that way, because there, people are searching, it's full of searchers, maybe more than people at like a Big Ten school or whatever. I don't know. Right. However, anywhere, cults thrive on college campuses all over the country, probably all over the world. Yeah. And they also thrive outside of college. It's not like just college students obviously get involved in cults, but it's college students are known to be especially to be prey, basically. Yes. And just to sum it up with a bow, I think, there was a slogan, maybe currently or maybe at some time uh, in the past, I'm not sure, but it was a slogan for Sarah Lawrence and it said, you are different, so are we. Okay. So there we go. So there's just a group of pals that kind of find each other at Sarah Lawrence. Okay. And sophomore year, they're all able to live together. It's kind of this like on-campus slash off-campus housing. Okay. There was housing like this at Syracuse too where it was like it technically was campus housing but it was like a house okay okay. and like no RA lived there RA is a resident advisor like a you're like another student who's like in charge I see okay so you very much have independence and everything like that but it's not like a classic dorm room situation it is like I think it has like six bedrooms or maybe even eight bedrooms or like whatever right and then like there's a common room and a kitchen and whatever you understand what I'm saying. So there was this group of friends, and so they all move into this house for sophomore year, and they're all very, very excited. And one of the students' name is Talia. And ever since she started at Sarah Lawrence, she was like on a mission. She wanted to be a lawyer. And she always talked about how she wanted to help out people like her dad. And so I guess she brought this up like as often as she could or whenever she, you know, whenever she could and bringing up her dad and talking about how her dad was a hero and worked like in special military operations and that he was currently really wrongfully in jail. Okay. And he never actually did anything wrong. And so that is inspiring her to want to be a lawyer to, you know, get the good people out of there. Right. Okay. Which sounds good to me. Okay. Sounds like a just cause. Kind of pulling a Kim Kardashian. Okay, yeah, yeah. But we love it. So yeah, so it wasn't long into their sophomore year when Talia tells her friends at this house, you know, how excited she is because her dad is finally getting out of jail. Yes. And she's like, you know, he needs a place to crash. Can he crash on our couch? And everyone, I think, mainly felt okay about it. They were like, you know, this is her dad. She has been missing him for so long. This is like a weird circumstance. Also, they didn't think he was going to stay there long. Like, my mom had spent the night, like, in my college, like, housing before. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, like, that weird. Well, and it's, yeah, and I'm sure that even if they did secretly feel a little weird about it, if other people are saying it's okay, like, you don't want to be that person. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's peer pressure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Even it's kind unintentional of, peer pressure. Right, right, right. Which is a very real thing, you yeah. know, because you do what you think people will, be, right. you, you know what I mean? And I think a lot of the people did feel like, they were like, oh, this is a little weird, but like, whatever, it's fine. You know, they were like, but it'll be okay. Like, especially thinking, you know, like this is temporary. So the people are like, oh yeah, he can crash here. But also it's weird. It's like you have nowhere else to go than like your daughter's college housing. Like that's just weird to me. But they were like, okay. So finally one day in the fall of 2010, Larry Ray enters the home at Sarah Lawrence. And everyone, you know, was happy to meet him and whatever. He just seemed kind of like a normal dad, you know, like a man in his 50s. Okay. They were like, okay, this is, you know, a dad. Cool. Like they didn't think much of it. But then that day he talked for hours and hours and everyone was just completely enthralled with what he was talking about. You know, he talked about his time in the Marines, how he was in the CIA and he like infiltrated the inner circle of the CIA and like messed with the minds of people in the CIA, which is, you know, whatever. It's so weird. And then, you know, he said he was Gorbachev's guide when he came to the U.S., And what's weird, though, is he actually did have some, like, photo evidence of this stuff. So people really believed him. Interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Like, he did have some, like, documents and photos and stuff like that. So people were like, oh, okay. Like, this is, this man is, like, important and, you know, has really lived a life. And Larry continued to talk about, about how all law enforcement was against him. And that even though he was wrongfully put in jail, he could now quote, pick up the pieces and fight the good fight. 
Oh, there you go. Yeah. Clearly a very interesting man, but it, it becomes clear pretty quickly that Larry is going to be spending the night at the house, the student's house, for like at least four days out of the week permanently. So I don't really know where he went the other three days of the week or, you know, approximately that. I don't really know. But it's like, why don't you live there all the time? Like, why are you still staying at this house? And, yeah. You know, it's very odd. So Talia never really like asked the roommates if it was okay. She never really brought it up that it was even happening, that he was like permanently staying there. It wasn't just like a crash for a couple days situation. Okay. It just kind of happened. Once again, everyone kind of thought it was weird, but they also knew how important it was for Talia to, you know, be able to be with her dad again. And so they were trying to be supportive and they're like, you know, okay. But then also he was really fun to be around. He was like a funny guy. He did a lot of cooking for them, made them really nice meals. He cleaned, he would take them out to dinner. And he was just like a very gracious guy that was always there to help out. Yeah. So in some ways, and these people are used to like, you know, having parents. So they kind of just roll with it. Right. And one day, Larry calls a house meeting with everyone. Fucking weird. Okay. So Tom's not doing the dishes. Oh, come on. Maybe on our Patreon, I'll, I'll tell about some stories I had with my college roommates about dishes. Jesus Christ. Love to hear it. Check it out. Check out that Patreon. Check baby. out that Patreon. We have fun. So Larry at this house meeting unveils his own philosophy that he has created called Quest for Potential. You know, spoiler alert, this is the same self-help shit that you've ever heard. Boom. He is saying that, you know, that you have a person within you that you are capable of being, a true self that is held back or restrained or clouded. He said that with this like quest for potential, he could take away the confusion in your life and allow you to just be who you are, how to achieve clarity. Right. You know, going clear with Scientology, basically. He is saying that there is all of this junk in your head that was caused by your parents, mainly, when you were growing up. And apparently he could, quote, help identify, articulate, and then process repressed memories, trauma, and abuse. Oh, boy. And if you went through his process, you would be healed. Oh, oh, oh. hallelujah. I mean, I really resonate with this. When you're 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Not that you're stupid or anything like that. Of course. I'm not, if you're 19 or 20 years old and you're listening to this, don't think this is like us dragging you. No. It's, it's just a, you're in a different place in your life. Right. And you just are looking for more of those things. And, you're, you know, you're out of your hometown for the first time, you know, really. You're out of, you know, you're living on your own. This time, you know, you're in a house with your friend. It's like it's a very transformative time when you want to find out who you are. Right. Exactly. So this, I bet, sounded pretty good to a lot of people. Absolutely. So the first person Larry started counseling or, you know, whatever you want to call it, was a friend of Talia's who lived in the house called Isabella. And Isabella was very, very kind of like closed off. She kind of stayed in her room a lot. She even would kind of hide behind her hair. I mean, she was very good friends with Talia, but... She didn't really have like a strong connection with a lot of people and was just kind of very quiet and reserved. Okay. One day, everyone noticed that Larry was in Isabella's room and he was in there for like a long time. And they found out that, you know, that Isabella was going through something really intense and Larry was helping her. And they talked for like 16 hours straight. Wow. So it wasn't long after that that Isabella then tells her mom that she isn't coming home for Christmas. Here we go. Yeah. And then Larry talks to Isabella's mother and says that Isabella was molested by a family friend when she was younger and that if she returns to their house in Texas, she will kill herself. He said, quote, You would have found her dead in your house. That's just the way it is. And how did the mother... You know, she wanted to talk more to Isabella. Right, well, she's probably like, well, what... Tell, what happened? If this is true, what happened? Who like, did this? What's the... Yeah, exactly. And why Why do I have to go through this fucking douchebag to get yes. to, to talk to you? Exactly. I mean, it's very strange. And I think that's what she was saying. And Larry was like, you know, she can't talk to you right now or she doesn't want to talk to you. 
But apparently, according to Isabella's mother, Cindy, Larry was very, very convincing over the phone that something was really wrong with Isabella and that Larry was going to help her and wanted to help her and was competent and qualified to, to help her. And this is another quote from Larry to Cindy, Isabella's mother. And by the way, we have a lot of this information, these, these audio clips and these direct quotes, because once again, this motherfucker wanted to record everything about himself. They always do this. They always do this. It has to be like a narcissistic trait well, because it completely puts them at risk. Well, it, it like, I, I don't get it. Because in their mind, they're probably thinking, well, if I have everything on a tape, I can show that I didn't do anything. I was exactly. But there's video of him, and we'll get into it, of him physically beating people. There's no way you could watch that tape and go, oh, now I get it, Larry. Exactly. It's the dumbest fucking thing I've... It's so stupid. I mean, I believe it was the director of Stolen Youth who met with Larry before Larry... Whatever, we, I won't spoil it, but... And Larry just gave him a lot of the, this audio because he thought that it, like, exonerated him. You know what I mean? It's like... You're yeah. Clear, but, like, I don't... It's just bizarre. So, anyway, we have all this shit recorded. So, this is something that... Larry said to Cindy, Isabella's mother. Cindy, you were a terrible mother back then. You were negligent. You didn't protect your daughter. That was then. That's not today. Today, you probably wouldn't let that happen. So he's already manipulating her, telling her that she was a bad mom. Wow. But that now she could be a good mom if she listens to him, basically. Wow. And her mom, Cindy, was like, I can't afford to go to New York. And if Isabella isn't going to come home, if she, like if she comes home, she's going to kill herself. Then, of course, I don't you know, want that. Right. And this is an interesting excerpt from the phone call. First, Cindy says, Isabella doesn't want to talk to me. I mean, how are we going to get this stuff straightened out if she doesn't talk to me? And then Larry says, You see, the thing is you got to understand it properly. No one is going to convince her to talk to you. I couldn't even do that, Cindy. I swear to you, the only thing I care about is to help Isabella. Wow. So Isabella continues these, you know, counseling sessions or just spending more time with Larry or whatever. And then suddenly Isabella is just happy and vibrant and outgoing and social. And it made all of her roommates think like, wow, like Larry must be legit. Wow. Like may maybe Larry can help all of us. Okay. So then one of the roommates named Santos begins talking with Larry. He talks about his struggles with his family and his, you know, specifically his family life. And Santos felt like Larry just really got it, just really understood exactly what Santos was talking about and what Santos was going through and just really felt good with Larry. Right. And Santos says that after he began speaking with Larry that, you know, his posture changed. He he walked around with his shoulders back. He was confident and he felt like he could become a good person and provider just like Larry. Now, there are two friends, one named Raven, who didn't actually live in the house, but was there all the time, and then Claudia, one of the roommates. And the two of them used to joke about how weird all this stuff was with Larry. Right. And Raven and Claudia were, were really good friends. So yeah, it was kind of just like a little thing that Claudia and Raven had, that it was just like, you know, this was all fucking weird. But Claudia was one of those people, and I knew a lot of people like this in college because I went to drama school, but Claudia felt like it was kind of cool or maybe more interesting or artsy or whatever to like be broken. Okay. Yeah. Like I see what you mean. It's very like indie movie girl. I get, I, I'm getting a vi yeah, I'm getting a picture, especially around circa 2009, 2010. Yes. I'm getting an idea of like what that person might be. Where you think you need that. You need that trauma to make you... Interesting. Interesting or artistic. Right. So Larry really fed off of this. Oh, I'm sure. And I guess the two of them just started talking and they started talking a lot. And they started talking for a long time. And then one night, all of the friends were smoking weed and they offered it to Claudia. And usually she would accept. But Claudia said no because she has schizophrenia. And that weed exacerbates schizophrenia. Okay. Kind of out of the blue. So all of her friends were like, what are you talking about? Like, you've never mentioned being schizophrenic ever. Right. And you, we've never witnessed anything. Like, where is this coming from? 
and it becomes clear that it, Larry is the one that's telling her that she has schizophrenia. Right, like he planted this yes. idea. And at that point, Raven, her good friend Raven, that's so Raven, we love Raven, was like, you know, this has really gotten out of hand and you, you need to stop listening to Larry. Yeah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not qualified. How could he diagnose you with that? Like, no. Right. Claudia just like doubles down and she says that her friends telling her she's not schizophrenic is hindering her and her journey to heal and to get better. Oh boy. Okay. This is classic. All right, Claudia. If it's like, if you don't have it my way, you're completely wrong. Okay. And she said, you know, that she's felt schizophrenic and had these issues her whole life, even though none of them had heard anything about this before. The people who kind of fell under his spell went through a very interesting journey where it was like first they were just thinking he was kind of weird to thinking, oh, he's kind of a cool guy to thinking like, oh, he's great to he's saving my fucking life. Right. To if you have anything bad to say about him, fuck you, we're done. Right. Then one of the roommates, Dan, starts dating Raven. Okay. And I guess the relationship was like very tumultuous. Okay. So Dan goes to Larry to like ask for advice. And Larry tells Dan that Dan is extremely intelligent and asks Dan why he's, you know, acting squirrely and lacking confidence. And Dan then opened up and said, you know, he had had questions about his sexuality since, you know, he hit puberty. And Larry just said, you know, I know for a fact you aren't gay, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, like, thank you, I guess. Like, what? what? Wow. You know, he's saying, you know, like this worry is just dragging you down and you just need to leave it because I know for a fact you aren't gay. So you don't even have to worry about it. How freeing must that feel? And not about being gay. Like, of course, I'm not, you know, I'm just saying about anything, any issue you have in your life, you talk to someone and they just say, I have it figured out for you already. Yes. So that must be so attractive to Dan. For sure. But then this is, you know, no surprise to anyone. Larry then tells Dan that Raven is holding him back and he shouldn't be with Raven. Okay. So Dan talks to Raven and is like, if you don't care about what Larry has to say, then you don't care about me. Like a really shitty ultimatum to give someone. All right. And Raven is like, I care about you. I want to be with you. But you know, like this is wrong. Like I can't allow this. I can't, this can't be my life. Well, and that's what I'm wondering when they say the relationship was tumultuous. Mm -hmm. Was it tumultuous because they just, for whatever reason, did sometimes didn't get along? Or was it tumultuous because of Larry? Because she didn't like, like, did they have issues outside of Larry? Yeah, I think so. I got the impression that it was like, they just had a tumultuous relationship okay. a little bit, se completely separate from Larry. Okay, okay. And then it was just kind of like all of a sudden that one day Dan went to go talk to Larry. Right. I'm so impressed by Raven. I mean, good for fucking Raven. Right. For for noticing, for seeing that something isn't right and, and saying no. That must have been really hard. And Absolutely. she does it again and again and again and again. Like, she's, a, I'm really, like, just very impressed. Especially as, you know, a college student. Like, that's really hard. Then Dan and Larry leave the coffee shop they were at where they were talking. And they turn a corner and they just see a limo just kind of waiting there. And inside the limo was Isabella... Santos, Claudia, and Talia. And they were just sitting and waiting there for like six hours. They were just waiting for Larry and Dan to be done with their conversation. Oh, and Dan didn't know they were... Dan didn't know they were waiting. Oh, so Dan like met Larry at a coffee shop, but mm -hmm. little did he know Larry rolled up in a limo. With, you know, these his friends in the back. And made them wait for six hours. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. He probably fucking just got it like, you know, where you rent a fucking bachelor, like every, any fucking problem. Yeah, anyone, you, anyone can fucking rent a limo. It's not, yeah. you know. They were just waiting for Dan. Like they knew Dan was going to just kind of join them after this. And he did. Dan got in the car, or the limo, excuse me, and kind of joined this group, this group within a group. So in the summer of 2011, so the summer after their sophomore year, Larry is actually living in an apartment on the Upper East Side of New York City. Okay, so by now he's he's no longer. So yeah. it was how long? About a year he actually lived yeah, on campus? Yeah, less than a year, like one school year. Okay, okay, very mm -hmm. interesting. Because I know this saga goes on for like a decade, mm -hmm. but okay. But yeah, so it all starts at Sarah Lawrence, but it's not at Sarah Lawrence the whole time. Exactly, okay. So Larry has this apartment on the Upper East Side, 
and Dan stays there too. And quickly it becomes the home for also Santos, Claudia, Isabella, and Talia, along with Larry. And everyone slept in the living room, like on air mattresses, I think, and stuff, except for Larry and Isabella who slept in the bedroom. This is a one bedroom apartment with all these people living in it. Yeah, so Larry and Isabella slept in the bedroom together. Oh. And everyone was like, this is kind of weird, but okay. Now and where's Talia in all this? Is she still- She's there. She's okay, like, she's there, yeah. okay. And Larry, you know, says, you know, Isabella needs a lot of help right now. She's very vulnerable. And, you know, she needs me, you know, with her all the time. And everyone just kind of believed him. Larry was really, you know, on their shit. He wanted to like really improve their lives and to be more productive and to all that shit. So he woke everyone up at 7 a.m. every morning and had them listen to the same goddamn fucking playlist he made. I guess it started with Baba O'Reilly by The Who. Jesus Christ. And he just made everyone work out. Kind of like, um... James Ray, when he would play yes. Welcome to the Jungle, when people right. would show up to work. Exactly. Also, how funny that they're both last name Ray. Ray, yeah. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even. I, that's funny. That is weird. And something that he really believed in was that, like, leaning into your masculinity or your femininity was very important and it would make you feel better. Okay. Now we're starting to see a little bit of, like, Nexium's uh, Society of Protectors yeah, or yeah, their yeah. Jeunesse. Mm hmm. You know, embracing womanhood, embracing manhood or whatever, you, you know, the idea yeah. of those things, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure this is not going to come as a surprise to anyone, but Larry thought that everyone is actually incredibly sexual, but we live in a puritanical society. Hey, come on, right? Come on, come loosen on, everyone up. Loves, everyone loves sex. Come on. Come on. We, it's the Let your hair fall. down. Unbutton your tie. Come on, come loosen on. it up. We're being silly. Get your dong out. Come on, give me that puss. And to a degree, you know, America is, you know, puritanical in some ways for damn sure. But like he made it seem like it was like everyone was just trying to fuck constantly and you right. know society well, that's what keith remember keith's yes. thing like fuck it i we're always wanting to fuck i want to fuck so remember that and whole you're like jesus was... christ like calm down yeah oh, god yeah it, it was th th that kind of energy and he said that larry said that dan needed to build confidence sexually and he asked if dan was attracted to isabella and then I was like, I mean, yeah, I got, you know, like, okay, yeah. Right. And one night, it was kind of an odd night where it was just Dan and Isabella at the apartment, which seems very convenient. And Isabella came out of the bedroom and just kind of all of a sudden, like, started making out with Dan and they hooked up. Wow, okay. And Dan was like, oh, this is cool, I guess. Like, yeah. a, you know, an attractive woman wants to, you know, fool around with me. But... He is also like, was she sent to do this? Yeah, yeah. He's kind of like, this is very strange. Interesting. It almost felt, yeah, once again, very next I'm like assigning someone to go seduce someone. Exactly. And Dan said, and I think this is a very good way of putting it, was that Larry was teaching sexual education and Larry was the professor and Isabella was the TA. Oh my God. Yeah. A teacher's assistant. Now, and what that's about, not what Larry said. That's what Dan said. But it, right. that's what it felt like that. Yeah. Okay. So now, so Isabella is becoming like his... Allison Mack. His Allison Mack, his right... Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Apparently, according to Larry, the best music to have sex to would be 13th century Gregorian chants. And if you don't know what that is, we're going to play a little bit of Gregorian chants right here and just kind of imagine... Having sex to it. Enjoy. I mean, it does slap. I am hard as a rock. Yeah. I mean, he might have been onto something. I am. Oh, man. But I'm also scared. But maybe that's fun. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. We'll figure it out. So that's just a little, you know, something for you. But he also said that it's really important to tease someone. So one time it was Larry, Isabella, and Dan. And Larry traces his finger down the back of Isabella. And Larry tells Dan to do it, too. And he's like, okay. And Isabella seems to be enjoying it. So that kind of gives Dan some confidence 
So Larry like tells Dan to like start having sex with Isabella. And then like Larry kind of gets into it too. So they're like oh, having he's a threesome. Pro- oh my God. And here's but this still, it's guy very weird. in his 50s. And Dan and Isabella are both like 21 or 20. Yes. Probably oh. 20. And this, and God, I'll just say it. Larry Ray, he looks like a girthy little dong. He like, does. He's not, he doesn't have it. I don't, I mean, he, oh. You really hate to hear it. You oh. really hate to hear it. My toes curl at yeah. the thought of him doing anything intimate yeah and this wasn't just a one-time occurrence often isabella and dan would have sex and larry would just watch sometimes he would join in but sometimes he would just watch oh this i had no idea i did did not heard. oh my god oh let's hear those chants fuck okay now i get it yeah 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 yeah. and it just was so strange for everyone dan said this i got so freaked out there was no consent in that situation isabella may have seemed to be pursuing all of this but her mind was being twisted by larry oh and i'm sure he can sense that this is not someone who actually wants to be doing this they might be acting like they do right but he can just tell that like something is not right something yeah and i'm sure well one it's probably also the 55 year old chode sitting in the corner oh god that too but like well yeah and i'm sure he can just sense even if larry's not there and he's being intimate with with isabella i'm sure you can just you'd be able to sense that this is not authentic oh So now let's jump ahead to the fall of 2011. This is the students' junior year. Okay. What a time. The students that were living at Larry's house over the summer, they would go to school during the day, go to class and stuff like that at Sarah Lawrence, and then they would travel back to Larry's apartment to spend the night. Like, So they, they, they lived in New York City. Okay. And at this time, one of the people living there, Santos, his sister Yalitza was apparently having a really hard time. She went to school at Columbia in New York City, and she just wasn't enjoying her life, and she was very lonely. And Santos wanted Larry to help Yalitza because he knew how great Larry was and that Larry could help. And whenever Yalitza went over to the apartment, she, you know, felt like it was fun and full of life, and she really liked it. And it wasn't long before Yalitza was part of the fold and was, you know, spending time at the apartment as well. Oh, I didn't realize she wasn't part of the original No, she did not go to Sarah Lawrence. Okay. And at this point, the apartment is getting really tight, getting really cramped. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, there are a a ton of people living in this one-bedroom apartment in New York City, like, Jesus Christ. I can't even believe that this was, like, happening. They were, like, renting the apartment from a friend or an acquaintance of Larry's. I don't know if they were paying rent. Like, I I don't even know what the really situation was exactly. Whatever it was, it was bizarre. But so the apartment was getting really cramped, and Larry said, I know there is a way to get all of this stuff organized, but I'm just waiting for you all to figure it out. The classic manipulation technique. Oh, God. And Larry would cut up Adderall because he needed all of them, the people living at the apartment, to stay up late, you know, working and doing stuff so that they would be really, really tired and would be like raw nerves, which is what he needed for them to really progress. Oh. And Larry was all about accountability. I mean, like, this is like fucking cult shit. It's like, oh my God. It's like so, like, to a T, cult shit. Yes. Well, you're taking something that is just a general accountability. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Accountability. It's something you've learned about since you were a child. Like, accountability. Yeah. But it's just something how they take, like, an everyday concept. But then fucking warp it and bastardize it. And corrupt it. And Mm -hmm. like. Exactly. It's so sick. So, you know, being with accountability, he believed that to be a good person, you need to be held accountable for everything that you do and you need to do something in return to make it right. You know, just saying sorry isn't enough. You need to make it right. Right. So some of the pans at the apartment had like little scratches on them, which is like, that's just what pans do. Yeah. But according to Larry, everything was getting ruined. 
and he convinces them, his followers, to falsely confess to ruining the pans or damaging his property or whatever. He, now he's getting false confessions from people. That This is where it starts. Obviously, there's this weird section. Like, it's already weird. Yeah. But this is where, in the di- where it started to get like, how? How do you convince yeah. someone? It's crazy. It's crazy. And all of his followers completely believe that Larry has the best intentions for all of them, that all he wants is for them to succeed and to evolve and to become the best person they can be. They can't imagine that Larry would be lying or anything like that. So they think that they must have done this stuff. They just can't remember it. They must have repressed the memory of them damaging his property. Wow, because it's one thing to say, you know, you've repressed a memory from childhood of something awful. Right, right. But to be like, no, yesterday you broke a dish. And you're pretending you're you've you've repressed that memory. Yes. That you've you know that or yesterday you broke the TV, mm-hmm. Dylan. Right. Imagine trying to like convince someone not of like even like I said not even of like a repressed memory of something from childhood, but literally that yesterday they literally did something like broke a TV. Yes. How how do you how do you do that? How do you actually get someone to like that's it's 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 wild. So his followers would just think and think and think for as long as they could until they kind of came up with this quote unquote memory of them doing something. And then they would tell Larry and Larry would accept it and say that that was true and that was what happened. And that made them think even further that it was true because Larry was the quote arbiter of truth as one of his followers put it. I believe Santos said that. And then they would thank Larry for holding them accountable and he would be like, I'm so proud of you. Like, the most manipulative shit. Like, wow. Yeah. Wow. And then Larry got, like, fucking obsessed with woodworking for God knows what reason. Isn't that amazing? It's They always have a weird hobby. They have a, an obsession. They will get these little obsessions that are kind of mundane on their own. Yeah. Like, like there's nothing wrong with woodworking. Like, you, you know, right. pop off. But what? Right, like with Ranieri, he was into volleyball and acapella. Like it, it, these what? weird, I've made this joke many times. It's like there's nothing wrong with those things. Yeah. But it's like if you found out Jeffrey Dahmer really loved to do needlepoint. You'd be like, huh? Wait, what? Like it just, all of a sudden this mundane activity kind of sticks out because you're like, why the fuck yeah. does this monster, like, yeah, it's it's weird. If why they would they have this? Yeah. And it becomes really important. It's not just like, oh, I have this hobby that I'm really obsessed with. It's like, I need need everyone to like fucking you know right become and involved with this exactly and so he was like that with woodworking and he the, once again this is a one-bedroom apartment with like a bunch of people living in it apartments in new york are typically small it just to begin with and he got like big like saws and tools and all this stuff and kept it in the apartment and he said that everything was like really expensive and really valuable like all of these tools and parts and machines and whatever Then Santos, one of the people living at the house, started dating Talia, Larry's daughter. And that was a bad thing. That was a mistake. Because then Larry started becoming particularly hard on Santos. This is one quote that Larry said to Santos. You are the one that has hurt me. You are the hurter. I am the victim of your hurt. So in regards to what? everything like that it was oh. that whatever santos did that santos couldn't remember was santos the one hurting larry not larry and and you know what i mean oh my god yeah and santos was at the point where he couldn't even really tell what was true and what wasn't and larry would just stare at santos saying over and over again come clean come clean come clean And Santos is literally losing his mind. He's like, I don't know what you want. I don't know. Right. Larry would also often put Santos in a sleeper hold until he passed out. He would ask Santos when he woke up, did the darkness envelop you? And just a quick side note, one time Dan, quote unquote, damaged the oven. And Larry had him kneel down and stood over Dan with a knife and threatened to dismember him. Yeah. I mean, there's videos of him. There's, I, we literally, we saw a video of him where he, he had a pair of pliers and he took Dan's tongue. Mm-hmm. It's was, really disturbing. And was like yanking on his tongue. Like, oh my it's, God. it's awful stuff. It's so bad. It's so crazy. 
So it quickly became clear that Talia and Isabella were really the only ones that were quote unquote safe from Larry. Like Larry wasn't going to like go after Talia or Isabella, but everyone else was fair game. So Larry did this to everyone, but especially to Santo, saying that they damaged something like a bunch of stuff in the in the apartment, which is like whatever. It's, well, one you would like, have immediate proof. You'd be like, that it's that right there. That true. is damaged, and that just goes to show you to be able to, like I was saying earlier, to be able to say you broke my television when the television is standing right yes. there, totally fine. It's this gaslighting. It literally makes you not understand reality. Exactly. So Santos starts making these big, huge, long lists of things or property or whatever that he has damaged. And every time he would turn it into Larry, Larry would say, you're not being forthcoming. It got to the point where Santos wrote down literally every single item in the apartment. Oh. And Larry said, you know, you need to make right on this. And, he, you know, you need to be held accountable because that's the most important thing. And Santos believed this so hard and was so desperate to do the right thing and to be able to just be out of this situation that he needed to get money from his family. Right. And his family didn't have a lot of money. One time he was with his mom and he asked for money and right then and there they walked to a pawn shop and his mom pawned all the jewelry she was wearing. Yeah. And gave him $750. And that was all she and and what he and what Larry was saying he owed him was like what? Thousands of Yeah, thousands and thousands of. You almost like you hate to say it but you like want the worst for this. Yeah, man. I mean he's an animal. You want This he's not that's that's a de, that's degrading to animals. He's a demon. Yes, he's a creature. Yeah. He's a fucking creature. Yeah. He's yeah. so sick. So Larry obviously is like, this isn't enough money. Like if your parents aren't going to help you, like you need to start asking everyone you fucking know. So Santos embarrassingly is like calling old friends asking for money. Right. Friends he hasn't spoke to. So of course this, fr- this person you haven't spoke to in a while, the first thing they want is money. So immediately he's burning bridges, yeah. losing. It's the most evil it's some oh god the cruelty is just un- incredible yeah then one day a bunch of people get an email from claudia with the subject line the truth and in the email it's all about her saying she's taking back allegations she made about larry saying like negative things about larry but she never did make any negative allegations about larry oh my in the first god. place this was basically a tactic to undo the damage to Larry's reputation that Raven, their old friend, was apparently doing around campus. Oh, I'm sure. Because Raven knew something was wrong and was like talking about it to people. Good. I mean, it's, it's, I'm like, she's amazing. Yeah. I can't imagine being that like so strong to do that when you're, you know, that young and you know, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Larry had Claudia do this as a way to kind of, to shut that down. And apparently the dean of students was on the email, but never reached out or tried to contact anyone. Oh. Apparently. And it was at this point that people on campus started to think like, okay, wow, this may be a cult. Yeah. So let's just talk a wee bit about Larry Ray and his whole deal. Mm. Can't wait to get the backstory on this dong he is a very strange guy i couldn't find too much about about his like childhood but he was born in brooklyn in 1959 and i guess originally his name was larry greco okay but you know he goes by larry ray and at the surface level he seemed just like a good normal guy with a you know good job good family good friends papa john's thank you for bringing up papa john's And his friends, you know, thought they knew everything about him. They thought they, you know, he didn't have any secrets, that he just was who he was. And one of his really good friends was Bernie Carrick, who was like a top guy in the Department of Correction. And Larry was the best man at his wedding. I mean, they were very, very close. Okay. And another friend was Frank DiDomaso. And they were also really good friends. And they, Frank felt like they were brothers. However, this wasn't really always the case. Okay. There was actually a lot that they didn't know about him and that they, you know, didn't understand. Okay. Apparently, Larry had a very long history of manipulating women. Apparently, this happened multiple times, and it's come from multiple different people that knew him during the 90s and said that he would sometimes offer sex with his girlfriend to his friends and business associates. Oh, God. And also, he had a wife while he was doing this. 
And Larry was also just very manipulative in his relationships just in general, not just with work associates or friends. Like one girlfriend tried to leave him and Larry sent graphic pictures of her to her parents. Oh my God. Yeah. And when another girl broke up with him, he got a GPS tracking device and tried to get it attached to her car. Oh my God. Another thing about Larry was that he said he was in the Marines, but he really was in the Air Force for 19 days. Oh God. I don't even know how you do that. I don't get it, but he did. But he still remained in contact with Marine General Charles Pittman and retired Marine Commandant General James L. Jones. Don't really know how he kept up those relationships when he was only in the Air Force for 19 days, but this just shows you how manipulative and fucking crazy and narcissistic this man is. Right. He also, during the 1980s, owned some bars and nightclubs in New Jersey. Okay. Now that I would buy. Yeah, and I think that was real. Like, that sounds like what I would expect this guy would be doing. That's kind of how he met uh, his friends, Carrick and DiTomaso. Now, apparently, you know, Carrick was getting into some shady stuff. Okay. And Larry apparently cooperated with investigators looking into Carrick's dealing with his friend DiTomaso, his two, you know, homies. And Carrick pleaded guilty to misdemeanor charges of accepting illegal illegal gifts and failing to report a loan. And uh, he also would plead guilty to federal tax fraud and to making false statements to officials. And then President Donald Trump actually pardoned Carrick. Oh, really? Oh, wow. So Larry was really like rolling with high rollers. Wow. He was like one degree away from Donald Trump. Now what? Yeah, it just doesn't like, fucking what? make sense. It's so weird that he like gets close to these people. One time, Di Tommaso beat the shit out of Larry, and Larry said that he has neurological damage from it, which, fuck him if that's even well, true. I don't give a fuck. I'm glad to know he got his fucking ass kicked. Yeah, and Di Tommaso pled guilty to disorderly conduct and was sentenced to one day of anger management. Yikes. Because fuck Larry Ray, seriously. Right. Larry Ray also said that he was like a key player in foreign policy. <clears throat> like, I, it's weird. Like, he said that he was like instrumental in like a lot of communication between the U.S. and Russia. And it's like people, like NATO officials say like they remember him being around. What? And that he like maybe made some calls, but like he wasn't important. But it's like he was there. That's fucking weird. I, I didn't know that. It's like, I don't know how he even fucking like does that he I, he does he didn't graduate college and not that there's anything wrong with that but it's like how do you get to these jobs well do you think he without really, a college education do you think he really was some sort of like deep state no like, but i think he was like around though i don't think he really like fucking like an epstein sort of or like i guess but like i don't yeah kind of like this so yeah fucking weird yeah it's very weird But he said that he was like instrumental in Gorbachev meeting Rudy Giuliani and that like he made it happen and all this stuff. And it's just like insane. Yeah. But it's like they think that maybe he like was just around, but he he wasn't really like Gorbachev's like homie. Well, how do you even get in their I don't know. That's crazy. Like how do you even get around? That's what's weird. It just shows you how manipulative and such a liar he is. Yeah. And how he thinks he deserves to be in these rooms. Well, and even from financially, how do you get in those? Right. I don't know. It's crazy. So in 2004, Larry's wife, Teresa, files for divorce and called the police saying that Larry hit Teresa. And when the police actually arrived, Larry and Talia, his daughter that we've been talking about, accused Teresa, the mother, of abusing the children. And there was just like, it was very contentious back and forth with the parents and the custody battle. And the forensic examiner believed that Larry coached Talia and his other daughter what to say to the authorities in their interviews yeah. to accuse their mother of abuse. Well, I'm sure he did. Yeah. yeah. And at one point, Larry like kidnapped Talia, like wouldn't return her oh my to God. her mother's side. 
And so that like violated his parole. And so he had to go to jail for that at one point. And one day, apparently, Larry calls Bernie and is like, hey, I'm getting indicted by the FBI about being involved in organized crime with Russian mobsters. But I didn't do it. I did not do it. I'm being set up by the FBI. And I need you, my friend Bernie Carrick, to call the FBI. So this was like before all the like rigmarole that I talked about before. The, like, oh my that God. Bear, Carrick went to jail. This is before. Right. That. And Bernie said no. And that's kind of something that like kicked off Larry going after Bernie. Oh. And then other times he said that George Bush and Dick Cheney and Rudy Giuliani all were trying to silence him because he knew too much about September 11th. Oh, ho, 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 like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. Okay, that's that's bold. I mean, that's bold. He had uh, he had some questions about Tower Seven. It yes. sounds like. Wow. Okay. And here's the deal. According to the New York Magazine, Larry Ray was diagnosed with histrionic and narcissistic personality disorders, and saying that he probably has Munchausen's disorder. We've talked on the podcast before about Munchausen by proxy. Yes. But Munchausen is when you like do shit to yourself to get like attention and whatever the fuck. Right. So when he was going through his custody battle with his ex-wife, he was psychologically examined. And this is a portion of the notes from the psychological examiner. Larry is able to manipulate and control almost any situation in which he finds himself, including a psychological interview with a forensic examiner, no matter how experienced that examiner may be. Mr. Ray is very good at what he does. Larry can be utterly charming, and one can be disarmed by his childlike simplicity and smile. But Mr. Ray is no child. He is a calculating, manipulative, and hostile man. Yeah. So even though he's all about taking accountability, he really thinks of himself as a victim. Right. That everyone is conspiring against him and everyone is doing things against him. And he never takes responsibility for anything. In June of 2007, what I was mentioning before, he violates his parole by abducting Talia, essentially. Right. And he's sentenced to three years in prison. And while he's in prison, he meets Lee Chen, who is actually the owner of the apartment that they all live in on the Upper East Side. Hmm. But at this point, they met in prison. And Larry told Lee Chen that Larry felt his daughters were under constant threat from Bernie Kerrig. And he was so convincing that Lee decided to help him. And Lee Chen let Larry stay in the apartment when he got out of jail. And he kind of just took over. He took over the living room couch and then he had the whole apartment. Then he had students over at the apartment. And apparently Lee said to Larry, he said, you know, like, why are you wasting your time with these like young students? This is so bizarre. And apparently Larry said, quote, you and I can only do so much, but I am building an army. So I don't even know what that fucking means. Yeah, because he clearly fucking wasn't. Like an army for what? He wasn't trying to like create a society or whatever like Keith Raniere was doing. Was literally DOS. trying to recreate society was what. Yeah. Yeah. This guy, it's like he's only trying to do this with like a few people. He's not like actively recruiting really. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's very odd. I don't really understand it, but he's building an army. So, you know, whatever. Now let's go ahead to 2013, the senior year for the students at Sarah Lawrence. Now, this is like extremely intense and I would say minor trigger warning here. You may want to jump ahead like 30 seconds, but also maybe you don't. It's just pretty graphic. One time it was near the end of Dan's time with this group at the apartment and Dan told Larry that he was still feeling unsure about his sexuality. And Larry just said, enough of this. And then he said to Isabella, go get one of your dresses. And in front of the whole group, Larry told Daniel to put on a dress and retrieve the mail from the building's lobby. And then when Dan came back to the, the apartment, Larry handed Dan a dildo and ordered him to penetrate himself while his friends laughed at him. And he said he was horrified and scared and crying. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's so disgusting. And thankfully this was, he was leaving, you know, Dan got out right. after this. But I mean, it's just, this man is sick. This man is so, so sadistic. 
Now, things kind of spiral even further into the fucking weird, where he's no longer saying, oh, you guys are destroying my stuff. He's saying, you guys are destroying my stuff and you're after me because Bernie Carrick put you up to this. Oh my God. Yes. And he would tell people, you never forget. You just don't want to remember. So it really made people think that he, they really were working for Bernie Carrick. They just couldn't remember it. Amazing. It's, it's almost, just, it, it's just, it, it's hard to wrap your head around. It's, I mean, it's so, it, it, it's crazy. And he would make them all stay up really, really late doing these interrogations on them. And they were only able to sleep and they were only able to eat when he said it was okay classic cult shit again yep and apparently some of the the his followers would just make shit up because they were so out of it i mean all of it is technically all made up oh yeah for sure like especially now they were just so out of it that they were just making shit up and it could never be resolved because they couldn't remember what really happened and so it, it made them constantly in debt to larry And at this point, Santos starts writing down all his quote-unquote memories and constructs a narrative that would not get him yelled at or hit by Larry. And it became fact to everyone that Bernie Carrick talked to Santos' parents when he was young, and they got him and Claudia together to sabotage Larry. Hmm. Which is, you know, this is not true. Just beyond insanity. And Larry also said to the group, Once Bernie gets out of jail... He's going to have you killed. And that's the right thing to do because you're a terrible person and no one would even know what happened to you. (sighs) Now, during this time, Isabella was helping Larry constantly, constantly around Larry, helping him document things and always being supportive. And Isabella said that Larry saved her and that he was her person. But Larry was like, no, we're not in a relationship. Then another sister of Santos came along. Her name was Felicia, and it was like love at first sight between Felicia and Larry. Whoa. Felicia is, you know, like in her probably mid to late 20s at this point, and, you know, Larry is out here being a 50-something-year-old man. Right. But it's love at first sight, apparently for both of them. But here's something that might surprise you. Felicia went to Harvard full ride out of a public school in the Bronx. That's in, that's which means she is unreal. A, a brilliant lady, yeah. Then she got into Columbia Med School, full ride. And at this point, she was doing her residency in L.A. to become a psychiatrist. And she just came back to New York for a visit, went out for dinner, and that changed her whole fucking life. Oh, I mean, she's like a smart, educated person. Uh, incredible. A grown person. Incredible. That just shows you Larry's chokehold on people. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes literally, but right now I just mean figuratively. So Felicia was living in LA, and so they kind of maintained this long distance relationship, which of course really upset Isabella, but you know, what can you do? And then all of the sudden, Larry is like, we got to get Felicia out of LA. And he puts her on speakerphone in front of everyone, and she is terrified, she is crying, she is absolutely beside herself, saying that people are coming after her because she's dating Larry, and that she needs to get out of LA now. So she gets to New York as soon as possible, and she is, I mean, hysterical. And I don't mean hysterical like a hysterical woman. I mean, literally, like, she is absolutely beside herself. Right. She's truly horrified that people working with Bernie Carrick are coming to kill her. And not only that, she knows deep in her soul, she knows this is a truth. She knows this is a truth just like the sky is blue that her parents were going to kill her or send someone to kill her because they were also working with Bernie Carrick. I mean, that's what he had convinced her. And her parents were poor, just like normal people. There was no way of them knowing Bernie Carrick. And at this point, Felicia is now saying that she was regularly sexually assaulted by her father growing up, which never happened. Right. And she just completely cut off contact with her parents. And so did her other siblings because her other siblings believed it as well. And her parents went to the police multiple times, but they were just like, they're technically adults. There's nothing we can do. Right. And over the years, so Santos, Yalitza, and Felicia's parents had given them, and by proxy given Larry, over $200,000. Oh. Because they believed they owed Larry that money. My God. The parents had to sell their house to cover the costs. 
However, Yalitza's, you know, and Santos and Felicia's parents did get a call, and it was from a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital saying that Yalitza had committed suicide and was in a coma. And her parents immediately were by her side. But then one day they arrived and security wouldn't let them into Yalitza's room. And also saying that if they wanted to meet with Yalitza's doctor, they needed to do it with Larry present. And Yalitza said that Larry was able to examine her when, when she was in a coma, look at lab results and make suggestions to the medical team. Oh, saying he saved my life. Now in 2014, just a year later, the same thing happened with Claudia. She attempted suicide. And Claudia would only talk to Larry and not her family. Right. And Claudia's mom, you know, said to the head nurse, what is he doing here? And the nurse replied, this is not the first time we've seen him. And apparently within the group, there was an estimated 12 suicide attempts during this time period. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. It's insane. Then Felicia starts saying that she herself was sent there to hurt Larry by Bernie Carrick. And she totally believes this. And things are just starting to get really weird where they themselves think that they were sent to do all this to Larry. And Dan is starting to really have doubts here but he feels like he's completely alone. He's isolated himself from his family. But Dan's family did reach out to Dan and just asked what was going on with Larry. And then they really just said how much they love Dan no matter what, and they just want the best for him and they want him to be a good man and that they love him. And I just wanted to point that out because that's really the single best thing you can do if you know someone in a cultic group or a abusive relationship. Right. Because the second you start ragging on Larry, they're going to shut down because they're still stuck. Yes. So you just need to remind them that you love them and that you are there for them. Right. So I just wanted to point that out. But unfortunately, this wasn't the end for Dan quite yet. As we mentioned before, uh, Larry used a pair of pliers on his tongue for doubting Larry because Larry could tell that Dan was doubting him. Right. And that he threatened to do the same to his dick and balls with the pliers. And... He also at one point made a rope out of plastic and aluminum foil and made Dan put it around his genitals and then Larry would tighten it and it would like break the skin and it was bad. I, I like I'm, I don't have words. Yeah. So one night Dan feels so defeated and he just is alone and decides to go up to the roof and he climbs up to the water tower. You know, and he's thinking about his life and what is going on and he does think about jumping. And then he just kind of started thinking. He was like, you know, I got into this for the truth. I wanted the truth, but I'm not being honest with myself. And that kind of let him think like, oh, maybe Larry is actually a bad guy. Right. And shortly thereafter, he just left. He just walked out and never came back and stopped answering their calls. And, you know, he got two jobs and joined another class so he could honestly say that he didn't have time. Right. To go back to the apartment. And of course, once Dan left, Larry was like, we don't talk to Dan anymore. Right. So they do that ship. Then a lot of them graduate in the spring slash summer of 2013. Santos was on medical leave, I think because of the mental abuse he was enduring. And he felt like he no longer had any friends. He couldn't even go to school and that all he had left in his life was Larry. So now it's the summer of 2013 and a bunch of them move to Pinehurst, North Carolina, which is where Larry's stepdad has a house. And he said he wanted to just like update the house and update the land as a gift to his stepfather. But of course, that really meant that the followers were doing a bunch of hard manual labor with no experience. They don't know what they're doing. And it was really hard work. There was torrential rain all that summer. They were moving trees, you know, like she like, it was like big work. And he had them do it over and over again. Like they prepared the soil for grass. Like they planted grass like three or four times because he kept saying they were doing it the wrong way. I mean, it's crazy. And he was also putting a lock on the fridge and they couldn't eat without his permission. Apparently, Larry, like, rarely slept and was on 120 milligrams of Adderall every single morning. Wow. But apparently he was even worse when he wasn't on the Adderall. 
Now at this point, Felicia is just completely breaking down emotionally and mentally. She's like completely reverted. She's like a child. Yeah. You can see some clips in Stolen Youth, the documentary on Hulu, and it's like really hard to watch. Yes. Especially knowing she was this like accomplished, educated, intelligent woman. Yeah. Going to literally like a child having a tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. It's, it's, she completely reverted. And you know, there's videos of her being like thrust down on the ground by Larry. I mean, it's really crazy. Yeah. And then at this point, it seemed like Larry was having health issues. Like there was this like wound on his leg that wouldn't heal. And then Larry is convincing Yalitza, Felicia's sister, that Yalitza has been poisoning not only him, but also Felicia for the past two years. And that is why she's in this mental state, because Yalitza had been poisoning her. Oh, my God. And this really upset Yalitza because she was like, I can't make that right poisoning my sister. Like, there's no amount of money I can pay to, like, rectify this, to be held accountable. Right. And apparently one night she just started walking and she just left. Wow. Now let's cut forward to 2015. Santos says that there was absolutely no sense of time and that all the days just completely ran together. And it wasn't long after that that Santos just couldn't take it anymore and left. And Felicia called Santos crying, saying that Larry was going to be so mad at her for letting him leave if he left. But he just couldn't do it. And and he was just like, I have to go. Yeah. Then a website comes out and it, it starts like circulating around Sarah Lawrence or the Sarah Lawrence community. And the website says that Claudia poisoned Raven and a lot of other people at Sarah Lawrence during their time at Sarah Lawrence, like really like the whole house that sophomore year. But they realize like there's really no way that she could have done that. Like no, nothing happened to anybody. Right. Like that didn't actually happen. And then there's a video confession that Larry clearly made Claudia make saying like, I'm doing this of my own free will, which is like, okay, no, you're not. Clearly. Right. And people were just really shocked. And she looked so subservient and so unlike herself. And it was just really bizarre. And so people started to try to find Claudia. So they find a phone number, they Google it, and they find a tweet that's a link to Claudia's escort page. Oh, no. It turns out that in 2014, Claudia started working as an escort under a fake name that was a combination of Larry's daughter's names, which is fucking weird. So fucking weird. And on her website, she was advertised as, uh, you know, offering her services for $8,000 a night. And she would give that money to Larry for what was apparently the damage she had done to the property in North Carolina. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. So some people that have put this together go to the authorities saying that she is being coerced into prostitution. And of course the police just fucking like laugh it off. And they're just like, it's too crazy. That's not real. Instead of look actually, you know, looking into it. So they told a fellow alumni, Ezra Marcus, who uh, was a reporter, and he looked into it and realized these things that, you know, Larry was actually never in the military. A lot of his stuff that he talked about was very much over embellished. He was described by a forensic examiner as being calculating, manipulative, and hostile. And Larry even talked to Ezra Marcus, the reporter, and Larry said that Claudia was giving him millions of dollars. She made like $2.5 million being an escort. Oh my God. And gave most, if not all of it to Larry because she believed she owed him that money. Oh. Because, you know, she was poisoning him. Oh God, I, oh. So when Ezra Marcus releases this article about Larry, it kind of wakes up Santos and Claudia to like how fucked up this is. Right. And at this point, Yalitza can't talk to her family anymore. She's still kind of scared of them and it's just too much and she can't handle it. But after a total of five years living in the apartment on the Upper East Side, Larry finally gets evicted because he doesn't actually own this apartment and probably wasn't paying rent and was like doing weird fucking woodworking. Jeez, God. So at this point, it's just Larry, Felicia, and Isabella. I'll be honest, I don't really know a ton about where Talia is at this point. Yeah, what, yeah. She doesn't really, she kind of moves out and I don't really know if she's still involved. I'm not really sure. Yeah, that's interesting. But at this point, mainly it's just Felicia, Isabella, and Larry, and they move into a friend's house in New Jersey. 
they're living like in squalor. This house is covered in like black mold and it's, it's like, it's bad. And it isn't long until Larry is then charged with multiple crimes, including sex trafficking, extortion, forced labor, and money laundering. So the FBI stormed into the house one morning and questioned Isabella and Felicia for six hours, you know, thinking that, you know, they must be abused by Larry and extorted by Larry. And, you know, they asked them questions about sex and money. But Isabella and Felicia, you know, fully were still believing Larry and believed that they were being poisoned by, you know, Bernie Carrick somehow. Right. And they were like fully confident that Larry was going to get out of prison and that justice would be served. It's very reminiscent of the Dossier Project. Right. Like Nikki Klein and all that are still Ranieri loyalists. Yeah. Right. But then eventually Felicia reaches out to Isabella and tells Isabella that according to her lawyers, she should no longer live with her. And then Isabella meets with her lawyers, with the prosecutors, and they're like, we could also charge you as a co-conspirator. But at this point, I don't even know if she believes that the prostitution thing is happening. Yeah. But even though I know she's doing it, but I think Larry is maybe convincing her it's not real. Yeah. uh, Yeah. She's in this place where it's like she's a perpetrator, but she also is a victim. And it's like kind of weird. It's very gray. Yeah. And then Isabella is living in Staten Island and Felicia is living in Queens. And at this point, Felicia is starting to kind of wake up right? slowly but surely. You know, she's saying, like, I don't know what's real or true. Um, she's still very afraid of her parents, but she says she's ready to, you know, like, talk to her siblings. And that she couldn't really remember if her memories from childhood were real or not because he took existing memories and completely warped them. And, but she was able to recognize that that had been happening. Right. And she could tell that Larry wanted her to feel isolated and alone. Right. At this point, Isabella very much still in it. She still trusts him completely in all contexts, she says. And she cares for him very deeply. But going back to Felicia, we now had learned that a part of the reason she was so distraught when she came to New York from L.A. was that Larry told her that she was threatened, beaten, and raped by associates of her father's. And she, you know, believed it. Ugh. And then when she first got to New York, it became clear that she would share a bed with Larry and Isabella and that none of them were allowed to sleep with clothes on. And Isabella would sometimes just have her hand on, like, Larry's dick. Right. And, you know, at first, Felicia was like, I don't like that. And then Larry's like, well, what's wrong with you? Aren't you a liberated woman? Oh, like, God. What, aren't you a smart, liberated person? Like, it's not, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? What's so tragic is he got to her, to Felicia, right before she became a full-ass doctor. Oh. He took everything away from her life, and she had so much to live for. But at the same time, we're also learning a little bit more about Claudia. Apparently, Isabella and Larry came into her apartment one time, told her to strip down, handcuffed her to a chair, and put a plastic bag over her head and threatened to kill her. Yeah. But what's weird is Isabella has no memory of this happening. And also, did they like put water on her and make her sit in front of like a cold like air conditioner to like freeze her and shit? Oh, I pro- I didn't hear that, but probably. Yeah. yeah. That make that's the that sounds right. And this is just crazy too that Isabella is doing this because she's like a good person. She wanted to be a child psychologist. I mean, she had like also had a whole life ahead of her. Then on January 29th, 2021, the FBI comes for Isabella. And then later her lawyer thinks that she may not be even competent for trial, basically saying like insanity, essentially. Right. And that really like bothers Isabella because she's like, can't understand that people don't like, you know what I mean? She's just still so brainwashed. Yeah. This is just a thing that actually happened between Felicia and Larry. But I think it's just a good way to, it's like a metaphor for the whole fucking situation. And that is he let her hair and she was like, loved her hair, Felicia. Right. He let her hair get so bad and have a huge, huge bunch of knots in the back of her head and just let it get so bad. And then one day he just starts brushing the knots out of her hair and is saying, you know, it it took me a whole week to get these knots out of your hair. I worked for a whole week on your hair. That's how much I love you. That's what I would do for you. 
but he let her hair get into those knots. Oh. He got her to the point where her hair was getting in those knots. Right. You know what I Well, I'm just, sure she just wasn't taking care of herself in any way. No, really. she was completely depressed and out of her mind. Right. Probably so not it, showering, probably not eating. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's just like, it's. I think that's just a really good way of put. It's like a metaphor, but it actually happened as well. Right. Thankfully, Santos, Yelitsa, Felicia, and their parents do eventually reunite. And it's a really beautiful moment in the movie or in the docuseries. I, I recommend you. You know, check it out. And Isabella eventually does plead guilty to money laundering and, you know, has started to publicly condemn Larry. Well, that's good. She said, quote, I now recognize that Lawrence not only hurt me, but used me in a way that caused harm to other people, to the other victims. I am deeply sorry. And on April 6, 2022, Larry was was found guilty and later sentenced to 60 years in prison. Mm. Thank God. Yeah, I mean, he's going to die. Yeah, there, he's 63 which is good. years old at this point, so it's yeah. essentially a life sentence. And just a week ago, Isabella got sentenced to 54 months in prison. So that's four and a half years. Yeah. Okay. So that is hard. Once again, that's kind of that like very much a gray area there. But now I think it's important to really talk about like how this could have happened. And we've already talked about it a little bit, but I think it's interesting. There was a lot of love bombing that was going on. And that's when like you first meet someone and they're like, oh my God, I love you so much. Let me do this for you. Let me give you this gift, blah, 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 blah. So much of that's going on when he first met people and when they first came into the apartment. I think it's also important to note that the brain isn't fully developed until you're 25. And, you know, your brain is still developing on areas of impulse control, social cognition, judgment, moral recognition, and others. And also the brain continues to like mature and it doesn't really like settle, I guess. That's not really the, really the right word, but um, until you're mid to late 20s. So these people in their late teens, early 20s are, I mean, perfect for this stuff. Yeah, truly. And what Larry was doing was actually considered to be psychological terrorism because it's an, quote, act of violence intentionally perpetuated on civilian non-combatants with the goal of furthering some ideological, religious, or political objective. Now, there is a quote by Annie Lennon, who is a writer on the neurological effects of manipulation and trauma. And I think this just makes a lot of sense. And this is what she has to say. As cults tend to discourage and severely punish those who question their leaders or practices, they tend to prevent both vertical and horizontal integration from happening. This means that negative emotions are more likely to get stuck into depressing mindsets, eventually surfacing as trauma, while critical thinking and reasoning are suppressed. Well, there you go. So this man, absolute chode. I mean, it seems like everyone is out. I don't really know about Talia still. I'll be honest. Yeah. That is that I'm very curious about Talia, but it seems like the other members are out and are working on healing and working on finding themselves again. Possibly, you know, Felicia may even possibly return to medicine. Good. It just seems like everyone's, you know, as far as I can tell, is doing a lot better. And this man was truly evil. And who knows how bad it, how much worse it could have gotten. Right. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Well, Maureen, I'm about to do some love bombing. Okay, come on. I got the list of names here of our top tier Patreon subscribers. Read them. Read them quick. Of course, the dream James Watkins, the finished face via Alunkfus, the madman Marcus Hall, the vivacious Vicky McHugh, the tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the heartbreak kid Chris Hackworth, the oh so suave Sean Richardson, the British bonebreaker Bex Martin, the notorious Nicholas Parker, the terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the sinister Sam Kiker, the nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vivilli, the loathsome Johnny Love, the carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the killer stud Carl Staub, the fire starter Heather Carter, the conqueror Christopher Damien Damaris, the awfully awesome Andy, the murderous Maggie Leach, the sir of sex. Sexy Sam Hackworth, the evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez, the maniacal Laura Maynard, the vicious Karen Van Buren, the arch nemesis Aaron Bird, the sadistic Sergio Castillo, the rapscallion Ryan Crumb, the beast Benjamin Huang, the devilish Chris Doucette, the psycho Sam, the electric Emily Jeong, the ghoulish Gerd Hankum, the renegade Corey Ramos, the crazed Carlos, the antagonist Andrew Park, the monstrous Michaela Schur, the witchy wonder J.P. Weimer, and the freaky Ben Forsyth. Wow, thank you so much to all of those gorgeous, beautiful, intelligent, sexy, 
funny, educated names. Hell yeah. We love you all. Thank you so much for being you. We could not do this without you. And thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers, all of you for listening. Thank you so much. And if you could please, you know, leave a review. Give us a five-star review. You know, please. It, it just takes a second. Please. We would love it. It would be cute. Absolutely. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night and goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.